Do, 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 Moving right along, digga ding, digga ding, do, 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 Moving right along, digga ding, digga ding. Why am I singing this song to you? Well, as it turns out, this week is moving week for me and Chloe and our family. It's very exciting and extremely busy which means that instead of doing a completely new episode for you today, I wanted to pull one out of the vault that you may not have heard yet, or if you have heard it, it's an opportunity to listen again and get something new. So that what is what is in store for today. But before I tell you what the episode is, I have to start with a little bit of gratitude. Well, I don't have to, but I want to. Because contributions from listeners like you are one of the ways that I can ensure that the Relationship Alive podcast will continue. And this week, I would love to thank Bruce, Ilana, Lydia, Timothy, Karina, and Kevin. Thank you so much for your generous support of the Relationship Alive podcast. And if you would like to contribute, whatever feels comfortable to you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And speaking of support, if you're looking for a little extra support and community when it comes to helping you sort through whatever's going on in your relationship, come join the Relationship Alive community on Facebook. You can just search for Relationship Alive Community, click join, we'll let you in, and it is a safe place for you to come and discuss whatever is going on with you. And we have some really amazing people there gathered with really positive, strong, generative contributions to you. So come and be a part of the Relationship Alive Community on Facebook. Okay, so on to today's episode. This is perhaps one of the most important episodes from the early days of the Relationship Alive podcast. When I started the show, I was so excited to bring this guest to you because her work had such a profound influence on my life, my relationship with Chloe, my relationship to sex, and my relationship to how my sex drive was controlling me and how I might have been sort of victimized by my own desires and the emotional states that were the result of those desires. So this is going to be a a re-airing of episode number five, how orgasms are hurting your relationship and how to fix it with Marnia Robinson, the author of Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. Now, I will tell you that having a conversation with your partner or pretty much anyone where you start talking about the detrimental effects of orgasms and how maybe you might not want to have so many can be challenging. And so in order to have that kind of conversation in a way that doesn't blow up in your face... I'm going to just suggest that if you haven't already, take a moment and download my free relationship communication guide. This guide has three tips in it that if you put them into practice will help you have any kind of conversation, either with your partner or with someone else, something great or something challenging. It will help you have that conversation in a way that connects you to the person that you're talking to instead of potentially separating you from that person. So to download the free guide, all you have to do is visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text the word relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And that will be one way for you to have a better chance of having this conversation about orgasms and how problematic they, they can be. Uh, without it becoming something to fight about. I will tell you that it makes for some pretty interesting dinner table conversations. Anyhow, I'm really excited to bring 
this episode back to you so you can hear it. Episode, it's a re-airing of episode number five, how orgasms are hurting your relationship and how to fix it with Marnia Robinson. And I will see you next week after all of my moving is done, my unpacking and repacking and purging. And it's been quite an eventful time. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm looking forward to being with you again next week and on with the show. Welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. And I'm curious, what if I told you that the way that you're probably having sex with your partner is designed to ultimately lead you down the path of boredom, having problems, and breaking up? While many modern-day approaches to overcoming this issue are all about trying to come up with ways to keep things interesting and novel with your partner, there's actually a better, more sustainable, effective way to keep things satisfying in the bedroom and to ensure that you continue to grow closer together in your intimacy and partnership. Today, our guest is Marnia Robinson author of the book Cupid's Poisoned Arrow, and moderator of the website reuniting.info. In her groundbreaking book, she describes exactly what is happening in your body when you have sex, and how many of the problems that we think are rooted in our relationship are actually rooted in the fact that we're having orgasms. Fortunately, she then tells us how to make love in a way that maximizes our bonding biochemistry. So what it lacks in climaxes, it makes up for in feelings of transcendence, union, and falling more and more deeply in love with your partner. In today's conversation, you are going to learn exactly why and how to make this shift. Marnia is also offering you a free guide to the best bonding behaviors to foster this connection and expansiveness with your partner. And we'll also have an opportunity for you to win a free signed copy of her book. Prepare to have much of what you think you know about sex turned on its head. Marnia Robinson, welcome to Relationship Alive. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. I have to say that I'm so excited for this conversation because your book is one of the few. I mean, many of the of the authors that I have on the show, I've read their books. They're, they have great information in them. And there's always at least a tidbit or two that really is helpful in terms of something new or adding some some energy to either my relationship or my ability to help others with their relationship. However, your book rocked my world. And so... Hopefully, everyone will pardon me from being a little extra enthusiastic for our conversation today. And, and my hope is that we may rock some worlds in the, uh, the listeners who are tuning into our episode today. We'll see. We'll see. So I actually came across your book um, in, a, in a counselor's office who was offering some counseling to me and my now ex-wife. And it was really funny because at the time, you know, we went in to see this counselor and she said, you know, I honestly don't think that there's anything wrong with your relationship. You're at a perfectly natural place to be, which for those people who don't know the whole story, and at this point, many people don't, um, we were married for seven years and we were, we had been together two years prior to that and things were had kind of reached a standstill in in our relationship. And we felt like we were really at an impasse and were really strongly considering whether we just needed to get divorced. We ended up getting divorced. But at the time, the counselor said, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. You're at a totally natural place. Have you thought about Caretza? (laughs) And we were both like, well, we have no idea what you're talking about. And she pulled off of her shelf your book, Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. And she just said, you have to read this and then we'll talk and see if you really think you have a problem or not. <laughs> now, I was in, I was, I was gung ho and really curious. And my ex at the time, she wasn't, she wasn't so curious. So that ended that particular version of the experiment. But I did read your book and 
it completely opened my eyes to a new way of seeing relationship, to a new way of seeing how sex, like the, the role of sex in a relationship and how it can work for us and how it can work against us. So Marnia, I'm wondering if you can take a moment and just explain for our listeners the basic premise of Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. Well, briefly, it's about the effects of sex on the brain, and particularly the effects of orgasm. And while we think of orgasm as just being that glorious, ecstatic high, there's actually more to it at the level of the brain. It's, it's the biggest natural blast of neurochemicals that you can engineer for yourself. In other words, you'd have to take drugs to get a, a more of a blast. And when Dutch researchers looked at brain scans of men ejaculating, they said it looked like the brain scans of people shooting heroin. So you can imagine that there's a lot going on between your ears at that big moment. What we don't or haven't acknowledged yet, although there are dozens of studies out now that talk about neurochemical events that follow orgasm, but what we haven't understood is those are in effect ripples that continue and they continue for up to a week, maybe two weeks in some people. And those ripples, changes in neurochemical fluctuations as the brain returns to equilibrium, actually influence how we see the world around us. So when our dopamine, for example, that's the gotta get it neurochemical, is peaking, we see Mr. or Ms. Wright, that's like the moment before orgasm, mm -hmm. <laughs> when that drops down afterward, and there are a lot of other kinds of changes that go on too, we see our partner through a filter of not so hot neurochemistry. And of course, we try to explain that to ourselves. I know I did for years. Obviously, it's because he didn't take out the trash that I'm now feeling like I want to bite his head off or something like that. And this happens without our awareness that we're setting off these little bombs in the bedroom. So what you're saying, it sounds like, is that you have an orgasm and, you know, now in today's day and age, people are having orgasms all over the place. Everyone takes ownership of their orgasm and their right to orgasm. And that's great. You have this amazing dopamine fueled experience that's, as you just said, such a, a pure natural high that you'd need to take drugs in order to actually replicate that in some other fashion. You have that amazing experience, but yet there's something going on in our bodies and in our brain chemistry after that that has a totally different effect that's not so much about what our partner is or isn't doing. Did they, well, you mentioned taking out the trash, or did they even like stay, you know, in bed with us long enough afterwards? But there's this biochemical thing that's happening that engenders something that's not exactly loving and connecting. Exactly. For example, they found that with each ejaculation, a man's androgen receptors drop in a key part of the brain. Now, androgen receptors are what pick up testosterone. So he may just feel kind of flat. You know, there are those jokes about roll over and snore. Oh, the man rolls over and snores. He's not trying to be mean. His brain just whacked him with a neurochemical change, and he's needing a bit of recovery time. Now, as a woman, I can tell you, I did not make this connection at all. I do not have any kind of immediate after hangover, you know, from orgasm. In me, the worst effects showed up at the end of two weeks. And I never would have made the connection if I hadn't been experimenting with Taoist lovemaking, where you um, make love frequently, but you don't go for climax. And I just noticed my relationships became so much more harmonious when I was having sex a lot, because sex is very nurturing for reasons we can get into. But the climax, some of us are more sensitive that, to that than we realize. In women, for example, a UK study showed that 8% of women have made the connection that orgasm sets up depression, tears, or major irritability in them. And when researchers looked more closely, they expected to find oh, these are women who were abused as children or they have um, abusive marriages. That's not what they found. They couldn't track it to any of those things. So it may just be a natural 
neurochemical events, something like PMS, you know, premenstrual, I mean, syndrome, but people make jokes about women are ready to shoot someone, you know, the, the days before their period, many of them. Mm-hmm. And then a couple days later, while their partner's still walking on eggshells, <laughs> waiting for bombs in the minefield, the woman is back to normal. And she's like, what's wrong with you? You know, why are you afraid of me? <laughs> <laughs> so, so both sexes are being affected and not exactly the same. This can show up just like PMS does in many different ways. In men, often it just shows up of, of them wanting another buds. Um, I, I could go on and on. There are changes in men that go out at least seven days. They've tracked. There's a little spike of testosterone at day seven after an ejaculation. They're, the VTA section of the brain that pumps out dopamine shrinks. Those neurons shrink for at seven days at least after uh, two ejaculations in a week. So there's a lot going on here, and we're all pretending like orgasm is just like blowing your nose. You know, it it has no (laughs) effects. (laughs) And it's not. (laughs) That, what you were just saying about PMS, I was just thinking about the timing and, you know, uh, apologies to my female listeners out there, but I'm just thinking, okay, so Marnia, you were just saying that you were noticing not nothing immediately after having an orgasm necessarily, but that within a week or two, you were having these really profound mood swings. Mood swings. And so I'm thinking about like when a woman ovulates and so she's really uh, biochemically primed to want sex. And like the time between that happening and the time between when your period happens, that's about two weeks, isn't it? So, mm-hmm. so d- wouldn't that make total sense that someone's like getting totally charged up, having sex, having orgasms, maybe lots of orgasms, and then two weeks later feeling like they got hit over the head with an emotional brick? But yeah, if- it's definitely biology playing tricks on us. And since we're speaking about two weeks, I just want to throw in there, the there's a whole sect of Jews that practice something they call kosher sex. Of course, that's not the proper Hebrew name, but that's close enough for us. And what they do is they stop having sex um, when the woman's period starts and for a period of time after that, that's a week so it's almost two weeks there that they're taking a time out basically every month. And when scientists studied exactly when ovulation occurs in a woman's cycle, the precise day now I'm talking about, mm-hmm. it turned out that that formula absolutely put partners raring to go back together at the perfect moment for conception. So there's you know different aspects of different cultures around the world have worked this out in different ways, but we've just been too arrogant as modern people to pay attention to what they found. The ancient Chinese Taoists had very similar understanding. They didn't have that kind of a schedule, but they said intercourse, very healthy, very good, have a lot of it. Climax, limit yourself because too much is going to cause um, well, weaken the energy to the brain. And I mean, they almost nailed it. If, if They didn't have the neurochemical names down, of course, but they really were careful observers. But we've just forgotten all that. There are cultures around the world, and I have essays in my book between each chapter from different sacred sex traditions showing how different groups of people tried to get at this same issue of managing sex without repressing it. Right, which I I really appreciated that you are bringing in all those different traditions to show that this isn't something that people haven't already thought about. But, right. But those parts of the tradition tend to be neglected or co-opted or... Because they just don't fit with our conception. I mean, and I know this because I did not grow up in a religious household, and nor was I sexually repressed. I was a, a perfect, I would call myself Kinsey baby, you know, who, who believed everything that, that Kinsey had sort of put into the mainstream, that orgasms were like blowing your nose, that the only thing you had to watch out for was sexual repression, and that if you just gave great orgasms and had great orgasms, you, were, you would ride off into the sunset in a blissful relationship. And so I was very disappointed when I mastered all those things, <laughs> <laughs> and my relationships were like tissue paper. I mean, they just, 
were splitting apart amazingly quickly. And my parents stayed married until death parted them. And my grandparents stayed married until death parted them. What was I doing wrong? Well, I was having more orgasms <laughs> than any of them put together. And I mean, they weren't particularly sexually repressed either. But I'll, I'll, I'm just telling you because, you know, that's my generation. Baby boomers, man, we were going to have our orgasms no matter what. So I was very good at that. And I was absolutely stunned when I first read my read my first Taoist book, and it, it said, this too much orgasm can cause subconscious resentment to build up between partners. I, I mean, I just, I couldn't believe it at first. And I think often people read my book, and that's their first reaction as well. This can't be right. You know, it can't be right. And yet, if you experiment with it, you quickly find out it is right. So then what do you do? We're getting to this point in the conversation where when I'm having this conversation with friends of mine or, or people that I work with, this is typically where someone speaks up and says, wait a minute, are you saying that I can't have orgasms or that I shouldn't <laughs> have orgasms? Right. Well, you, you've seen how that goes. <laughs> um, what I used to do, this was before I wrote my book, when I first started twigging that this really was an issue, first of all, I talked to a lot of men about it and they said, Oh, well, yeah, there is something to that. I, in fact, my best girlfriend and I were at a cocktail party in Europe, and we happened to speak to a very sexy diplomat from the West Indies. And we were telling him about all this stuff. And he said, of course, that's right. He said, why do you think the man says, oh, shit, when he comes? Now, I had never heard that from a man. But in his culture, the benefit and pleasure from sex clearly came from intercourse. And he didn't want it to end. Mm. Do you see? So he didn't like that ending feeling. So after I heard some of these things from men, I thought, well, I'm going to get a whole case of the book that I first read about this, which was called Taoist Secrets of Love, Cultivating Male Sexual Energy. Now, it's a book by men for men. And I would just keep that on hand. And the minute anybody was even faintly interested in this or feeling hostile because the topic came up, I would just say, hey, read this book and tell me what you think. So I found that that would keep people's projections of their natural hostility to this idea off of me personally and redirect them to this book. <laughs> <laughs> and then over the years, I realized that I felt like there was more information that people needed than was in that book. Plus, women were quite hostile to the idea of passing up orgasm, too. So in my book, I tried to tell my story so women could hopefully see some of their own experiences in that. And then I met my husband, and he added all the science because he, too, got benefits to his astonishment. And then he went digging for the science. How can this be? And he found quite a lot of it, some of which I've already alluded to. So, so yeah. I want to mention two things. First is, for those people who are curious, we are going to be doing a giveaway of Marnia's book, Cupid's Poison Arrow. She has generously offered to sign a copy for one of our lucky listeners. So I'll be telling you how to qualify for that uh, over the course of this episode. And the second thing that I wanted to do is to take a moment and just sort of quickly summarize where we are in this conversation. So we've talked about how you, if you have orgasms or orgasmic sex, it sets off this chain reaction in your body and in your brain, whether you're a man or a woman, that ultimately leads to feelings of dissatisfaction, depression, could be mental fogginess, and what I read in your book is that the whole purpose of that is it's about our genes finding the, the best way to express themselves. It's basically we are engineered to grow dissatisfied with our sexual partners and move on to someone else. Well, that's true. Evolution does not like monogamy or pair bonding of any kind. And the reason is if you have your offspring with different partners, those offspring have more diverse immune systems. So if the plague rolls through town, your genes have a better chance of making it through these kinds of, you know, viral and biological disasters if they're in different buses that have different immune systems. So that's 
that's why there are only three to five percent of mammal species that pair bond at all. And we are in that weird three to five percent because we have the brain mechanisms that do allow us to fall in love and that make us yearn for a sustainable relationship. Now, I don't mean every single human being yearns for that. There are always outliers in any characteristic of this type. The, the other thing I wanted to go back to, because I don't want anybody to be left confused, is that for the first couple years or less of a relationship, lovers are jacked up on a very special neurochemical cocktail, which I call honeymoon neurochemistry. So if you're in a new relationship, everything I'm saying will not make any sense to you at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, it won't, because you're sort of in that blissful, you know, high where there may be these ups and downs, but you just look past them because you're jacked up on extra dopamine and adrenaline and nerve growth factor, and you have lower serotonin, which can make you obsessed with your partner and so forth. But within two years, Italian researchers have found you come back to normal. And that's when you can really start to see these mood swings and changes in perception of your partner can start to creep into your relationship. So if you're in the honeymoon phase, then you're probably not experiencing what we're talking about. You probably stopped listening already. <laughs> <laughs> but if you're if you are still listening, can you talk just for a minute about um what you wrote in your book which was that it's it was important for you to or it's it's been important for people to start relationships with Caretza versus it's much harder to switch to Caretza or something like that. Am I getting that right? Yes. If you're lucky enough to have this information before you start the sexual part of a new relationship, it can be a really good way to ease into your relationship. And then you can try conventional sex down the road a little bit and see what you notice. If you try to do it the other way, You'll be, you'll find it very confusing to mix or to connect cause and effect because the ripples that I'm talking about can have effects out a week or two. And if you're mixing conventional sex and Caretza, you really can't figure out which one was the benefit. And your brain will tell you that it was always the orgasmic sex that provided the benefits <laughs> because that's what gets sperm connected to eggs. So, you, you know, you, we've all evolved to believe that's the answer and never question that. So if I'm not going to have orgasms, what, what am I going to have? <laughs> well, hopefully you're going to have lots of intercourse and preferably rather gentle intercourse that is not goal driven. And what couples on my site have discovered is that even if you slip into orgasm without intending to, it doesn't have quite the same neurochemical cocktail as it does when you really go for it. So, for example, you, you want to make love in waves. You get aroused during your lovemaking, and then you calm back down and just let everything rest and get aroused again and calm back down. And you'll find that if you do that, gradually your body learns to sort of pace itself to that and there's no discomfort and you really feel well fed at the end like you you really got your needs met but you have to be careful not to get too close to the edge because that can cause physical discomfort known as blue balls or lovers nuts in, in the vernacular <laughs> um, the ancient Taoists had a cure for that by the way it's cold water they regard that as being in an overheated yang state and that cold water or yin returns turns you to comfort levels. <laughs> and people have reported that that is indeed the case. Um, the second thing I want to talk about, in, in my book, I talk about the importance of daily bonding behaviors. So is this a good time to get into that? Yeah, and maybe set it up by talking about how we have these two programs running, one being the mating program, which is all about dopamine and seeking and that, that, you know, passion fueled orgasm producing, probably Separation offspring. Producing. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you have that yeah. on the one hand. So what is the other program? And 
And in a in a way, this is sort of a form of biohacking, right? Where you're using yes. Okay, so let's yes, let's it's, talk about it, it is a way of hacking your biochemistry. So as I said, humans are pair bonders. We're in that tiny group of mammal species who are pair bonders. That means we have very special mechanisms in our brain that permit us to fall in love. And in the book, I explain how scientists discovered this in little mouse-like creatures called bulls. But there are definite mechanisms in a pair bonder's brain that respond to, um, that, that allow you to bond with a person as opposed to just the experience of getting off. So it's a unique person you become wired to, to some degree or for some period, but that's what makes that possible is things in your brain. Now, pair bonding evolved before humans could could speak, of course. So pair bonding works on signals that are very primitive, that speak to a primitive part of the brain. The, they all evolved from the same kinds of signals that keep mammal caregivers attached to mammal infants. So there are certain things that, you know, a mother cat does to stay bonded to her kittens and all mammals do this because mammal babies have to stay attached to their parents to nurse and be cared for for a certain amount of time before they go off on their own. That's a different from reptiles, for example. Now, in lovers, human lovers, these same signals, which psychologists call attachment cues, which I call bonding behaviors, these same signals, slightly modified, are what enable lovers to bond. So things that you go, go watch your favorite romantic movie and you'll see a lot of these things, smiling with eye contact, skin to skin contact, gazing into each other's eyes, kissing with lips and tongues, holding, spooning, wordless sounds of contentment and pleasure, those mmm sounds that have nothing to do with logic or words. They're just sounds that speak to that primitive part of the brain, stroking, hugging, gentle intercourse, I would put in that category as well. <clears throat> Obviously, touching and sucking of nipples or breasts. And these kinds of bonding behaviors deliver this soothing message to the amygdala in this primitive part of the brain that lowers our defenses and makes it easy for us to feel safe with this other person. Now, obviously, new lovers do this a lot, but as these weird cycles of highs and lows start to creep into the relationship, especially after the honeymoon period, couples tend to drift apart and they're not engaging in these behaviors. And these behaviors need to be almost daily to keep us feeling close at this subconscious level. So just for our listeners, I want you to know that Marnia has also provided us with a list of bonding behaviors that you can download from my website if you go to neilsatin.com slash cupid that will bring you to a page with the the show notes for this episode and also the opportunity to download this bonding behaviors guide and if you do that within the first week of this episode airing that will also qualify you for the giveaway that i mentioned earlier of marnia's book another way that you can qualify for that giveaway, or if you're curious about the bonding behaviors and maybe you're uh, driving in your car and you can't go to a website right now, if you come to a stoplight or you have your phone handy, you can just text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 and just follow the instructions and that will tell you how to qualify for the giveaway and how to download Marnia's Bonding Behaviors Guide. And you also explain these almost like a, a program to follow in Cupid's Poison Arrow that you call the exchanges. Is that right? Yes. I found that I was a big cheater when I was trying to learn this. In other words, I kept going too close to the edge and trying to dazzle my partner with my amazing foreplay skills and all sorts of things like this. And I really needed some structure. And if you see, you're... Imagine you're in a new relationship and you're trying to, to stay on course with this. It's very tough and neither lover knows, oh, well, should I stop things because it seems like we're getting too heated up here or shouldn't I? And they don't want to be the one to pull the plug. So it's just easier for some of us to have a structure. So what that is, is exercises that you can do for three weeks. Each night is a sort of adventure with a little 
you know, thing you can do that's based on attachment cues that I just discussed. But you could make up your own, too. There's no magic in the activities. The activities work because bonding behaviors work. So if you're disciplined and you can come up with your own attachment activities every night, then you don't need the exchanges. But for some of us, it's very helpful to have three weeks of ecstatic exchanges to keep us on course. And that three weeks gets you through that refractory period post whatever orgasmic sex you were having. It gets you comfortably through that and then into uh, right. a, a period hopefully. where you're where you're hopefully experiencing the benefits, the, the full benefits of doing Carezza with your partner. Right. And, and then you can have a good taste of what we're talking about. And so what is that experience like? And I, I ask this because... A lot of people who are struggling in their relationships, what they're struggling with is a lack of passion. So I can imagine them listening to this and thinking like, well, wait a minute, like I want passion. I want like that, the crazy, the way it feels when you fall in love. I want that. And so what what is this going to offer me if I switch from that, either trying to figure out how to get that again with my partner or taking a a lover on the side or something like that, or just breaking up and starting over again with someone new, what would this actually, what would the experience be like and how would that compare? Right. Well, this is a kind of a, you could call it reverse psychology, but it's really reverse physiology. If you want to make yourself more sensitive to pleasure, you want to reduce stimulation but still get all the benefits of those attachment cues to release pleasurable neurochemicals in your brain. There's a wonderful TED talk by a man named Doug Weil called The Pleasure Trap. He is speaking mostly about food, but he's saying the same thing. If you're having trouble dieting because you're hooked on junk food, he said what you really need to do is fast. Because when you fast for a while, your dopamine receptors and all these things in your brain come back to normal and even start reaching out more and become more sensitive to pleasure. And then if you have an apple juice, you feel like you're in heaven. So it's a little bit the same way with this. Usually if couples have pulled away from each other, they're not getting the benefits of attachment. They're not getting the good feelings from skin to skin contact or intercourse or any of those things. And then they're looking for this amazing high to sort of medicate their bad feelings. And this says, whoa, 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 just take it back to ground zero, return your brain to normal levels of sensitivity to pleasure. And then even the simplest um, kinds of intercourse will feel more appealing to you. Now, I have to say that I first wrote this book over 10 years ago, and that people could feel those benefits fairly quickly within a few weeks, no problem. Today, young lovers are being pounded by extreme stimulation. Some of the the women have learned to get their orgasms from vibrators. Well, that's going to make it, it's going to be a while before their brain returns to normal sensitivity so that a penis, you know, feels good to them again. Same with men who are using a death grip for masturbation and watching a lot of internet porn with a constant novel stimulation and so forth. It's going to take their brains longer to return to this ground zero point of normal responsivity to pleasure. So I, I, you know, it's hard to say if everybody will be able to experience within three weeks, what would have been normal for their ancestors. But if you, if you stay with it long enough, your sensitivity to pleasure, more vanilla kinds of pleasure will return, but it may take a bit longer these days. So the idea is that by ratcheting back a little bit, you're actually allowing your brain to regain sensitivity to things that are maybe more normal. You use the word vanilla and, and where you might find those things to be extremely pleasurable again with the exact same person that you've been with for this period right. of time. And I'm, I'm not judging people who prefer chocolate or other flavors, but the point I'm trying to make is vanilla is what's sustainable. If you have to hang from the chandelier in the dining room to get your jollies, 
that's pretty exhausting. And you're going to find that there are some days your partner really is just not up for that. So if you want something to be sustainably pleasurable, you have to learn to find vanilla sex pleasurable. I mean, it's that simple. At least I don't want to have to work that hard. And I know my husband doesn't either. So I think the search for constant new stimulation can be a real trap, a real downward spiral for people. And they don't even know they're in it. And then you're always resentful because your partner isn't meeting your needs. Well, it would take Superman to meet some of the needs that we're coming up with, with by the way we manage our sexual energy today. Right. Now, what what are the long-term effects or experiences of practicing Karetsa with your with your partner, how and how does that stack up against, you know, or do you still find yourself kind of craving passion, orgasms, etc.? cetera? Um, and I'm going to be honest. Well, one of the reasons that I'm asking this is because I'm wondering, let's say you take your an awesome Karetsa couple and then one of those people encounters someone else and has a crazy dopamine response to that person how how um safe is a couple that's you know not doing that anymore to like are are they vulnerable to kind of outside pernicious influences that might come in and say yeah you're not getting this in your relationship so come out and and you know screw me like crazy um well first of all I think that if somebody's consistent with their Karetsa practice, they feel whole and they feel more fulfilled. So they're not coming from a sense of lack. So they're not as vulnerable to that sort of thing. If they're mixing Karetsa with conventional sex, then all that goes out the window because during the the low periods of recovery, that urge for, oh, I just need something more stimulating could push you anywhere. It can blow your sails in any direction. Now, you ask what people might expect over the long term, and I thought you might ask something like that. So I actually asked a couple of men on my forum who I know have been practicing this for years. And one of them, this guy's, um, just to give you a little background, from a very sex-positive Jewish background, he said, people might notice they become more attached to sexual intercourse with their partner more enamored of their partner, more in love. They become more attentive to their partner's needs in every point of life, not just sex. They care less about positions and erotic turn-ons and fantasy, and more about being in the moment and connecting with their partner for a long time with total presence. And they will have a lot more sex more frequently and for a lot longer. <laughs> so that seems to be the big benefit that the men report over yeah, and over you're, from Yeah, you're bringing <laughs> tears to my eyes, Marnia. It's, uh, <laughs> no, but I mean, that really was his experience. He came from a, you know, completely disbelieving in any of this, but he just was a naturally curious guy and he started experimenting with it and he's still going with it now several years later and he's thrilled with the reaction that, you know, the, the way his his marriage has gone. And this guy's been doing this, something like this for about 20 years. He didn't even call it Karetsa. He was like me. He stumbled into these ideas through with the Taoist angle. He said, I would say what people can expect is more attraction between partners. For a man, there's often a feeling of, I can't get enough of you when he withholds orgasm. He said, and is there anything a woman loves more than the affectionate attention of her mate? Well, I would say, He's right, except when she's (laughs) post-orgasmic. Anyway, he says this usually translates into more frequent sex. (laughs) Also, more tenderness and overall lovingness between couples, and couples are more attentive to each other. So I asked those two guys independently, and that was their reaction. And what that's worth, I mean... Yeah, that's great. What about the the female perspective on the long-term benefits? Yeah, I find that it it makes me certainly want to overlook my partner's errors, whatever they may be, and to spoil him because it's it makes your your partner look adorable to you. You know, and mothers can find their wrinkly little newborn babies beautiful. We can find each other beautiful at any age and so forth if we're tapping into those brain mechanisms that are spoken to with these daily attachment cues and not producing these explosive orgasms that leave us, you know, kind of rippling for a week or two. So I don't know. I just, 
I don't, feelings of lingering contentment, reduced anxiety, more energy, it, communication between us is easier. We don't use any NVC or anything like that. We never mince words with each other, but we just don't stay mad about anything. So we, we don't have this feeling of walking around in eggshells in our relationship, which for me is so wonderful. I just love it. And how, and do you feel like it, well, it's, I heard what you were saying earlier was that it has this overall experience of you feeling whole and fulfilled. And so what's that like for you or for women when, you know, that, hunk of a man approaches them from across the room and they just feel that carnal fire, you know, oh, take me now. Like, does that not happen anymore because you're full and feeling good and bonded to your mate or is... Well, it doesn't happen to me. What what I noticed quite early in my marriage doing this Caretza thing was that I just didn't want anyone else touching me. I didn't have an amazing allergic reaction to it. But I just, when I got a massage, for example, I'm in a community where, you know, that's massage is very normal. I, I just only wanted my husband to massage me. And I, I, I remember finding that actually curious because I'm very open and uninhibited. And I was like, wow, this is interesting. I'm bonded to my husband now in such a way that I really don't, you know, welcome another man's touch, even in a non-invasive way. So... I don't mean I was afraid of it or horrified by it. I just, it was noticeable that I preferred my husband's touch. So that was interesting. Yeah. And probably worth reminding listeners at this point that what we're talking about are engaging in practices that foster the production of a totally different kind of neurochemistry that's all about really attaching you to that other person. Right. And in a good way, it's not a needy kind of attachment that you get during that addictive high phase of the, the honeymoon. It's, it's more like, okay, if I have to be out of town or my husband has to be out of town, we don't go to pieces. We're fi absolutely fine with that, but we're very happy to be around each other and we don't need space. So it's, it's balance, it's equilibrium, it, and it's based on balanced brain chemistry. That's my theory is that this isn't about sitting down with a shrink to work on all your issues. It's about taking the actions that keep your brain in balance, which in turn controls your perception of the world and helps you see things through, you know, rose tinted glasses as opposed to darkly shadowed glasses. That makes total sense to me, especially when you revisit the idea of what happens with your brain chemistry after an orgasm. You're naturally on this roller coaster that that is designed to produce again animosity towards your your partner uh or to predispose you toward infidelity even because you need a, a novel partner a way to to reactivate those dopamine receptors that you have right you're looking for a fix and and a new nothing like new love you know to give you that fix and and that was the merry-go-round i was on for years until i started to say wait a minute what is going on here? This just can't be bad luck. <laughs> this keeps happening. Yeah, and it's certainly possible that people do have patterns that they repeat over and over again and that those are worth looking at and deciding. But one of those Absolutely. patterns could very well be, yeah, I'm having orgasm-fueled sex with, with people over and over again, and, and this is where it leads. Right. And I didn't mean to imply you were right to correct me, you know, that nobody has issues that they should look at. Certainly, they do have issues. People do have issues. And sometimes they do need professional help in looking at them. But it's my theory that by getting their brains in balance with a Caretza type practice or meditation or anything that helps you return your brain balance, then you're going to be better off when you go looking at your issues. In other words, you'll get more out of your therapy or your introspection if your brain is in balance and not projecting all kinds of neurochemical ripples onto the rest of the world and your history and your future and everything. Yeah, at least you're giving yourself a, a level playing field or even if not that, an advantage toward addressing what your issues actually are versus being 
caught in that cycle where you're trying to get a fix when you're in this uh, bonding behavior Caretza place it's like there's nothing to fix you don't have to get a fix there's everything is fine at least on the level of your brain chemistry and what's happening biochemically right and and that's exactly right you said it well and hopefully in terms of your your level of attachment to your to your partner as well exactly I'm curious so do you think then that it's better I was wondering before this interview like well what would be the ideal balance of like you know a few weeks of Caretza and then you know have crazy orgasm sex for a week and then then go back or but it sounds like what you're saying is that actually once you make that shift you may not want to go back or or should you do it you are you are now going to start noticing how that changes you with this awareness that you have Right. I, I thought about the idea of scheduling. I do think people should schedule intercourse because, it, you know, if they're having trouble because life is very busy or whatever, it's very important to get that intercourse time in there. So I think that can be extremely helpful. And with Caretza, you don't need a whole lot of ex spontaneous excitement to make anything happen. So you can certainly at least just connect genitals and lie still if you're too tired to do anything else. There's even a technique called soft entry where you can pop the male member into the female and just lie there connected without any intercourse. So you really no performance needed to get this kind of exchange happening. Um, the problem with scheduling orgasms is that it seems to be the orgasms you go for that cause the biggest hangover. So if you say, okay, Saturday night's it, honey, we're going to go for orgasm, then you're that that rush of dopamine that it takes to get you over the top sometimes can create bigger ripples than if you're just nosing along, not ever trying to go for orgasm, but occasionally it happens, which occasionally it does. I should warn your listeners that sometimes you just are going to flow over that waterfall. And people say if they haven't really been going for it, they don't notice as much of a ripple afterwards. So that's one tip. I did, however, notice that there's a couple on my forum who say that they do always have orgasmic sex once a month right before her period, and then they take a time out for a while. And that works great for them. And the rest of the time, they connect daily for some kind of gentle intercourse. And they've just worked that out. And it's, hey, it works for them. And I think each couple should find what does work for them. I also asked the guys on my forum what they had to say about that. If you'd like to hear their answers, I can share those. Absolutely. Okay, one of them said, the first guy said, the ideal ratio is 100% Caretza. He said, but that is not practical. The body sometimes wants to have an orgasm, but there's no way to make this a thing like, I'll try this every three times we have sex. So, but as I said, there is a couple that does the, the pre-period orgasm. The other guy said, I personally don't feel a need for any kind of balance. I only go over by accident. Can't say for someone just starting out, maybe if you get agitated, it might be valuable to reset by having a, a normal orgasm and start anew. So that was their wisdom. That brings me to another question. And I'm, I hope my listeners will forgive us because we're, we're talking a little bit longer than typical, but I, I feel like there's a couple important questions that we still need to get to. So the first of those is in the, um, in the exchanges that you talk about in your book, there there is actual intercourse happening. So there's there are pair bonding behaviors, some of the things that you talked about, among others. And then there are days, if you're following the program, where you're actually having physical intercourse. And I was wondering, especially since you've mentioned a couple times this like getting close and like people who accidentally are having orgasms and how that doesn't seem to be as bad. But if you're getting close like that, aren't you feeding the dopamine cycle in your body versus like really being slow and relaxed about it? Well, yes, that can be a definite problem. You don't want to go too close to the edge. And no one who starts out with this can do it perfectly. It's like a little bit like learning to ride a bicycle or maybe you're body just needs time to adjust because it's in the case of men been producing all this semen and now that's got nowhere to go. So it takes 
time for your body to adjust production and demand <laughs> when it <laughs> drops that radically. Um, but you don't want to go close to that edge. That can stress the prostate. It's just not a good idea. So less is more as you're learning this. But it does, it will raise your dopamine some. Dopamine's not evil. You need balanced levels of dopamine for compassion, for you know, not have, being depressed and all kinds of other things. It's not like you're trying to wipe out dopamine. What you just don't want is a big spike that's going to set up a, a down regulation that takes time for your body to return to equilibrium. So by keeping those rises gentle or the degree of arousal gentle, it, it really um, sets off less of, of this kind of ripple. And you may still notice some ripples for a while, but you, it's, you do, it's like riding a bike or a surfboard or a snowboard. After a while, you just kind of get the hang of it. You know where to stop and what to do. And it just takes a little practice. I will say that this is quite different from most Tantra. Tantra, a lot of the Tantra techniques, and, and you can't lump them all together because they're quite different. And there's one version of Tantra that's just very close to Karetsa, which I can talk about too. Um, but most Tantra, you're trying to use sex as a drug high, and you're trying to pump up your arousal, but withhold that orgasm until you have some kind of, you know, big neurochemical blast. And you'll notice that a lot of Tantra partners, they're in communities where they're changing partners all the time. Even the original Tantra was about cheating, well, not cheating, but it was a, a religious practice where you had sex with other people's spouses. So it's, it wasn't about caretza or bonding or making a relationship sustainable on a daily basis. It was about pumping yourself up for a drug high. Now, there is a kind of tantra that's taught by Diana Richardson, which is very close to caretza. And I could give your listeners a link to a lovely trailer called Slow Sex. It's a trailer for a movie that she made in Europe. And you can hear couples talking about this, and it's, it's absolutely delightful. That's great. Jobs, and so. and we are going to have Diana Richardson on our show, in fact. So, oh, wonderful. So wonderful. that will be perfect. And um, yes, if you have those links, we will definitely make those available as part of the show notes. And I also just realized, while well, we've mentioned your book several times, obviously, which is available on Amazon and other booksellers, Cupid's Poison Arrow, um, we've neglected to mention your website. So what is your website? What's the best way for people to reach out and get in touch with you, Marnia? It's reuniting.info, like information. Reuniting.info. And we will have that link posted as well on neilsatin.com. One last question for you. Oh, I, I have two last questions. All right. So question number one, they're actually related, is a simple question. If someone, If people want to get started, what do they do? And the second question is, what if one partner, let's say the person listening to this podcast, wants to do this and they're met with that resistance from their other partner? You can't take away my orgasms or you want me to what? What do they do? So how do you get started and what's a good way to talk about it when you're met with resistance like that? Well, I'll, I'll give you the advice of one of these guys that I just mentioned because I thought it was really good. He said... I don't ever tell people about not having an orgasm. <laughs> He's a natural <laughs> promoter, this guy. He said to my female partner, which happens to be his wife in his case, I would say, I am not going to come this time. And then keep saying that each time we have sex. She will be upset or curious or both. But he said you have to make her comfortable with not having an orgasm or my not having one, you know, even though she continues to have an orgasm. So people have to get comfortable with that before they get to the point where they're willing to say, I'll try that myself. And that seems to be the general wisdom on the forum is that you, instead of trying to control what your partner does, you just control what you do in bed. And then if you see any benefits, you share those just as you would any natural conversation. And eventually maybe the person would be willing to experiment for a few weeks because it's, you're not asking them to cut off any body parts. They're just passing up orgasm for a few weeks while having a lot of intercourse and see what they see. That makes perfect sense. So it's really about 
owning your own experience and hopefully provoking some curiosity on the part of your partner. Well, why, why aren't you? And yeah. th then it becomes a conversation as opposed to, I would really like you to not come for the next three weeks and, and see how that goes. You know, that probably wouldn't right. go so well. Now, I do know that, you know, if people get through about chapter four of my book, they are curious and they do want to try it. But sometimes there's so much resistance, they won't even read anything about it. And I'll just say a funny thing about this book. The women all relate to the first few chapters the best because it's a story. And they have told me, well, why do you have all that science in chapters four through eight? And the men read the book and they're like, what's all that stuff at the beginning? You don't need that. Just <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I, well, it, it definitely creates desire, some some dopamine fueled desire for the the latter part of the book, where you actually get to the. Like I remember when I when I reached it the first time, I was like, "Finally, you know, okay, already. I'm I'm convinced. You have thoroughly convinced <laughs> me. What do I do?" So for people who want to get started, obviously, reading your book is great, and and I think that it is really helpful to be thoroughly immersed in that the understanding of what approaching sex in a traditionally orgasmic way is doing to you. It's so helpful to really have a thorough understanding of that. And your book does an amazing job of laying that out. There's no way you can read that and not at least be curious if not downright convinced, oh my word, I have to try this in a totally different way. So Let's say that someone has read the first part of your book, or at least listening to this interview, they're, they're intrigued and they're like, all right, well, what do I do? Um, hopefully they, at least they can download the bonding behaviors from the website and that would be a good place to start. But what would you say to them, you know, tonight or for the next few nights with their partner? What would, what should they try? Well, they can make up their own attachment cues, exchange massages or foot massages or head rubs or something that's not a foreplay driven activity. That's just nurturing your partner in a way that's going to relax that primitive part of the brain and make it bond more emotionally. And of course, if you do have intercourse, take it easy, go gently and, and experiment with maybe not reaching climax. Another tip from a man was, he said, I t decided to try it, having sex in the morning with my wife and not orgasming just to see how I felt during the day because he was going to get up and go do something. So he wouldn't lie there awake, you know, wishing he had his climax. And he said that was the perfect entree for him. So people have to be a little clever about seeing what, what would help them experiment. There's no one right way to do this. Yeah, and it seems like, as I'm imagining the people listening, that there are probably some of you who you have a partner, you're having sex all the time, and more power to you. And so for you, it's maybe going to be a question of, all right, like for the next week, let's just be sweet with each other. And let's see what we can do to foster that sweetness and maybe even make a game out of not having sex and just fostering that that sweetness and see what that's like. And I think, Marnia, you were suggesting that it it's going to take at least a week, if not two to three weeks, to really feel the benefit. So you might even ultimately set it up as an experiment. What if we only did this for, for two or three weeks? And we, let's just see what it does. On the other hand, if you're in a relationship where you're not having a lot of sex, maybe you're hardly ever having sex, then this might be a great way to reconnect and to to make clear to your partner that sex is off the table. Like this isn't about having sex. This is about just finding ways to really connect with each other. And right. Taking off performance demands is hugely beneficial. Any sex therapist will tell you that too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the time when people aren't having a lot of sex, then there's one person who really wishes they were. <laughs> and so there's yeah. this weird dynamic that goes on of pursuing and distancing. And so this takes that right off the table and, and allows you to, to hopefully get to a new place of fueling your, the oxytocin in your relationship, uh, which is what's going to help you feel really connected with your partner.
Right. And it's surprisingly satisfying. And once you make that discovery, then you realize, oh my gosh, I can feel satisfied without getting that climax that I thought I so desperately needed. And that will just set you up to stay with the practice for longer and be willing to experiment with it. You have to first learn how to nurture yourself really well without climax, and then you can take it from there. Well, Marnia, thank you so much for being on our show today. It's you're just such a wealth of information and and humor, and it's been really a delight to chat with you about your book Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. And to remind our listeners, you can visit Marnia's site, which is reuniting.info, and you can also find out the link to her site by visiting neilsatin.com/cupid which will give you the link to download her bonding behaviors guide that she so generously offered us. And if you download that guide or text the word passion to the number 33444 in the next week after this episode first airs, that will also qualify you for the giveaway of a signed copy of Marnia Robinson's book, Cupid's Poisoned Arrow. So thank you again, Marnia, for being on Relationship Alive today. It was a pleasure. And thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time.